I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I listen to STEM Talk, interviewing the most interesting people in the world of science and technology. Stay curious, my friends. Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Carnegis, and I'm here today with IHMC's director, Dr. Ken Ford. Hi, Don. Good to be here with you. Uh, we have a great interview today that you and Tom Jones did with Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer. Kelvin is a pioneer in understanding thunderstorm dynamics and predictability, variational data assimilation, mesoscale dynamics, computational fluid dynamics, massively parallel computing, and aviation weather modeling and predicting of extreme weather. He knows a lot of stuff. <laughs> and his location at the University of Oklahoma and childhood in Kansas has no doubt focused his interests on tornadoes. Kelvin has, through his own research and through his leadership, greatly shaped the scientific landscape in meteorology and storm prediction and tracking. His work has no doubt saved many lives. Kelvin is a longtime member of the National Science Board and is now its vice chairman. The National Science Board is the governing body of the National Science Foundation and also provides science policy guidance to Congress and the President. We overlapped on the science board for about four years, and Kelvin was a superb member and now serves, as I mentioned, as the board's vice chair. I believe that his term will end soon, and he will certainly be missed. And Ken, you worked with Kelvin as co-chairman of the National Science Board Task Force on Hurricane Science and Engineering in the 2005-2006 timeframe, correct? Yes, Don. That uh, task force and the production of the subsequent report was quite the experience. Living in Pensacola and having just experienced Hurricane Ivan, which devastated our area, and then Hurricane Katrina, which trashed much of the rest of the Gulf Coast, I was highly motivated to work on this problem. After 2004 and 2005 hurricane seasons, around here we've come to especially fear hurricanes with Russian names like Ivan and Katrina. <laughs> Let's hope that there's not a Hurricane Rasputin anytime soon. For sure. Before we get to today's interview, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we especially appreciate all the wonderful five-star reviews that are piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continuously and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews with an eye toward selecting the best, most pithy, and praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. And as always, if you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the rather peculiar nickname, ARFO6C, and here is ARFO6C's review. Brilliant. Just brilliant. <laughs> Brevity is a virtue, I suppose. Although we enjoy longer reviews, ARFO6C's review was concise, and dare we say it, brilliant. <laughs> Again, thank you and all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped make STEM Talk a success right out of the gate. Okay, now on to the interview. Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer is Vice President for Research, Regents Professor of Meteorology, Weather News Chair Emeritus, and Roger and Sherry Teagan, Presidential Professor at the University of Oklahoma. In 1989, Dr. Drogemeyer was a co-founder of the National Science Foundation's Science and Technology Center for Analysis and Prediction of Storms, often known as CAPS. Today, CAPS is recognized around the world as a pioneer of storm-scale numerical weather prediction. STEM talk. STEM, talk. STEM, talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. This is Don Carnegis, and co-hosting this episode with me today is Tom Jones, a former NASA astronaut and a senior research scientist at IHMC. Now, Kelvin, this is Tom Jones up at the Virginia offices of IHMC. Glad to have you on the program. Thank you for inviting me. I'm pleased to be here. Yeah, it's very exciting. So, Kelvin, just tell us a little bit about your background and how it influenced your decision to study weather. 
Well, you know, growing up in central Kansas, I was exposed to pretty exciting weather uh, year round. Uh, springtime, of course, there are a lot of thunderstorms and tornadoes in Kansas. Summers are kind of hot and boring. Uh, the fall is a beautiful season, which is sort of the second tornado season of the year. And then winters can be pretty brutal, uh, getting a blizzard sweeping across the plains. And I live right in central Kansas, so it was right at the junction between the hills, the rolling hills to the east and the, the prairie and plains to the west and north. And so uh, I had a chance to really see storms coming pretty much from all directions. And I remember I remember as a child really being fascinated with the, the grandeur and the power of the atmosphere and, and just uh, how quickly the weather could change, which always fascinated me. So I really kind of growing up in that part of the country, I think that really got me interested in weather from, from day one. Yeah, absolutely. Think about The Wizard of Oz, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I was very curious. I know when I first saw that movie as a child, I was just definitely scared of that tornado. I could hardly bear to watch it on TV. And then when I got older, I was like, okay, how did they actually do that back in the 40s? And it was a very creative thing that they did. Uh, looked awfully realistic. <laughs> did, you have a, did you have a storm cellar? We did. It was it was really much more of a of a basement beneath beneath our house, kind of a dugout, and uh, we stored stuff down there. And my mother, uh, you know, put canned goods and things like that down there. Uh, and it it had a door that opened from the inside of our house, uh, uh, just basically a big door that opened upward. Uh, and uh, you know, we only went down there a few times, but the times that we did were quite frightening because the sirens were blowing. And of course, as a kid, you never really know what's uh, what's going on. I remember one uh, time I looked out the window. There's actually only one window. It was a ground level, and I saw only very very black clouds in a horizontal line, low to the horizon, and then then the ground. And I just remember that distinctly, uh, not knowing what could happen, but it just that that image is indelibly printed in my mind as being just super scary. Fortunately, uh, no tornadoes ever occurred then or subsequent to that, but uh, there have been towns near my hometown that have basically been close to being destroyed by tornadoes. So uh, we, we were very fortunate. Yeah, that had to be an incredibly scary experience. So what, what, what about the weather most interested you? It sounds like you experienced kind of a, a vast array of different types of weather situations. Really, really, that's absolutely right. And I think it was the um, the springtime weather, the severe storms and tornadoes that I found especially interesting and, and, and fascinating because one of the things that I love even to this day is is wind. Uh, to me, the perfect day is uh, about, you know, 60 degrees, very low clouds, uh, very cloudy, low clouds and winds of about 40 miles an hour. It's just something so powerful about the wind and, and so wonderful when you hear it blowing through the trees and and whistling around uh, buildings and things like that. So uh, you got most of those types of, uh, of wind events when you could actually be outside to experience it as opposed to a, bl a blizzard where you'd never want to be outside. But the springtime storms especially were, were tremendous. And then when the winds would come through and you'd see the dramatic drop in temperature and and that kind of thing uh, was really, really uh, exciting. But for me, it wasn't so much about the precipitation. It was really more about the wind, the majestic clouds, and the different colors of the sky during storms. You know, the, the sort of green of the hailstorms and the big puffy white clouds of the uh, of the thunderheads, as we called them back then. And uh, and then being able to go out after I uh, learned to drive and uh, go out on the edge of town and just watch the storms come in and be able to see some of the funnel clouds. That was just endlessly fascinating to me. And absolutely beautiful. It's almost artistic in nature. It really is. In fact, it's interesting. We had a uh, an exhibit down here at the University of Oklahoma this past year uh, devoted solely to uh, to uh, art art that was basically uh, related to the weather. And it's just extraordinary how different people see the atmosphere and its its majesty and beauty and capture it on canvas uh, in a variety of different ways, oils and and also watercolors and things like that. And it was a Biennale, and we actually had a, a it was judged by some of the foremost leaders in art in the, in the nation. And one of the things I think is really neat about that is it brings together the fine arts, the, the beauty and the love of, of artistic creation and physical science. And, the, of course, the students that are down here studying the weather are all fascinated by it. They all want to go chase storms. But I think this really brought a new dimension of understanding of the beauty of the atmosphere as, as it's captured by artists. So it was really kind of a nice coming together of STEM fields and, and the arts. Yeah, that's very cool. So you had this kind of fascination with weather just from an early age. Were you always interested in the science aspect of, of weather when you were growing up? You know, I it was more my exposure was really more watching the TV weather cast and especially during um, a severe weather when the warnings would come on TV and it would be that beep that you never knew if whether it was a nuclear attack and a duck and cover thing, you know, <laughs> or something like a thunderstorm. And I remember the black and white radars and being fascinated by those. But I think it wasn't until I was, uh, frankly, in, in 
probably what's now called middle school is grade school for us, where I really started to get interested in science and uh, where we would, uh, you know, plant uh, bean seeds in a pot with dirt and watch them grow over a period of time. And and we had film strips. You remember the old film strips where you put in these little viewers? And I would uh, be very interested in that. It was around that time that the um, uh, ESSA formed. I don't even remember the name of the acronym, Earth Sciences uh, Association or something like that. There was a precursor to our current National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They put out a lot of educational materials. And I remember seeing things on the space program at the time, which, of course, was very, very big back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and, and, of course, not so much to do with weather, but just science in general. And I think that really fed my, my interest in, in weather and science uh, overall. So you were talking about the meteorologists on TV. I just have to ask you, did you ever want to be a meteorologist on TV? Was that ever an interest of yours or was it always kind of directed in the science direction? You know, it's interesting. I, I don't really have a, a clear answer to that because I think when I went to college from a small town in Kansas, I knew that going to, to the University of Oklahoma would be really neat. They had a great weather program, but I had no idea really what I would do with a degree. Uh, I never really thought about broadcasting, although in Kansas, the uh, the folks that were on TV were credentialed meteorologists and were, were quite good. There was a show actually on PBS at the time called AM Weather that talked a lot about uh, you know aviation weather, and I was always fascinated with airplanes and aviation, so I kind of learned the lingo and, and wrote for brochures and, and things like that. But uh, But I think it... it I wasn't, I don't think I really had a sense of broadcasting or anything else, really. I just wanted to go learn more about the atmosphere and see how it worked. And, and honestly, it wasn't until the latter part of my uh, undergraduate study in my senior year where um, a, an individual at the National Sphere Storms Lab, where I was fortunate enough to work as, a, as an undergrad work study, suggested I go to graduate school. And I, I didn't really even know, hadn't ever really even thought about that. But that was where I think I got serious about, about research, although being at NSSL, as an undergraduate, I got a chance to rub elbows with, with scientists and really look at, at research and what it was. And we, we did a lot of storm chasing, trying to photograph tornadoes at close range to be able to estimate wind speeds from how debris was, was flying through the air. And we did photogrammetric uh, analyses and things like that. But I think it was really during that period of time that I began to appreciate the importance of research and that, that studying the atmosphere uh, was really an important part of, uh, of what I was interested in. It's really interesting. So tell us a little bit more about your academic training. You said that you kind of first, your interest was first peaked in undergrad, and then where did you go from there? Yeah, I, I came to the University of Oklahoma as an undergraduate. They were the kind of the closest program nearby, being from central Kansas. But I also, <laughs> oddly enough, loved the football team here. I loved uh, OU football. So to some extent, OU football had an influence in drawing me down here. Uh, and then um, as I was, um, as I say, getting in my sort of senior year, um, one of the, um, the scientists at Sears Storms Lab suggested I uh, go to graduate school at the University of Illinois and work with one person in particular who it turns out is a computer scientist. His PhD is in computer science, but he was really a pioneer in using uh, uh, supercomputers at that time or high-performance computers to model thunderstorms to try to understand how they worked. And uh, at that time, computers were just kind of coming into the the age of where we could uh, do three-dimensional simulations of the entire storm cloud and the physical processes somewhat simplistically, but but still it was three dimensions. And that was a that was a big deal. Two-dimensional models have been around and even one-dimensional models. You say, what is a one-dimensional model? So basically a, a, a you know kind of a column through a cloud. Two-dimensional is like a slab or a cylinder, a two-dimensional like a, a slice of bread or a, or a soup can. But the 3D was really looking at the storm in all of its uh, uh, fullness. And one of the interesting things was with three dimensions, you could really understand how storms acquire rotation. And so that really was the pathway toward understanding how tornadoes form and, you know, how, wh which storms are going to likely produce tornadoes and which ones uh, won't. So that's what led me to go to the University of Illinois. And it was just the, the best decision in the world for me. Tell us about how meteorology has changed in the last two decades. You know, my impression of tornadoes and tornado science is, you know, based on movies like Twister. And, and I'm sure that there's a uh, been a lot of evolution since even that movie came out. And why don't you tell us some of the real science behind the study of tornadoes and how it's changed? Uh, there have been absolutely uh, seminal changes, I would say, in the last 20 or 30 years or so in, in meteorology, driven by a number of factors. The first one is uh, high-performance computing, because, of course, when we talk about weather forecasting, we talk about solving extraordinarily difficult, challenging uh, sets of equations. Uh, think of taking uh, the atmosphere and all of its complexity and turning it into a mathematical model and then putting that model into a computer, and then into that model, putting observations, the current state of the atmosphere as best we can measure it, and then projecting that, that state forward in time. That's essentially what a weather forecast model does. 
And so uh, back in the uh, the 1980s, that's when uh, really supercomputers uh, sort of came into existence. And meteorology, frankly, was one of the early drivers of the, the original computer developed, which was called the ENIAC, the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, back around World War II uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where, where the architecture was kind of designed. And the, one of the very first calculations, apart from ballistic trajectories for, for uh, large bombs, was uh, a weather forecast, the very first weather forecast. So Advances in computers have been, uh, in large part, uh, responsible for improving our ability to both understand the atmosphere and predict it. Uh, observations, of course, I mentioned, are very, very important. And uh, about 20 years ago, uh, the first national network of Doppler weather radars was commissioned called NEXRAD, or the WSR-88D, Weather Surveillance Radar uh, 88 Doppler. What's unique about that radar is that it can sense the direction of movement of precipitation particles. And so it only does so in a direction parallel to the radar beam as a beam scans around in a, in a circle and tilts up at various angles in a, to create a conical volume. But it gave us really the the, uh, the first kind of comprehensive three-dimensional look at the atmosphere on very short time scales. Um, the third component, in addition to computing and, and observing systems, there have been many other innovations in observing systems, especially satellites, which have been tremendous, uh, has been our understanding of the atmosphere, uh, uh, driven in large part by numerical simulation models. And, and so uh, that understanding has allowed us to uh, get a handle on uh, developing forecast outlooks, for example, that might be two or three days in advance, because we now know what uh, states of the atmosphere, what um, what kind of conditions are conducive to diff different types of weather. So it's not at all unusual for you to turn on the TV or get on the National Weather Service and hear them say, you know, three days from now, we expect a very severe uh, tornado outbreak in the southeast or something like that. Not exactly, you know, what county it's going to be in or exactly where the storms are going to be, but but a general notion of, of the timing and the location and, and um, the intensity. And then as you get closer to the actual event, it kind of telescopes down in time to where you get much more precise about the timing and so on. So that has really been made possible by our uh, uh, understanding of the atmosphere. So those three things together, and then really with observations came the ability to, uh, to assimilate, as we call it, those those observations into the uh, numerical models to have accurate predictions. And kind of the best example I can give you there is a kind of a heart transplant. Um, you know, during the early days of the heart transplant, you put a heart into a recipient and there would be immediate rejection and the lifespan of those folks would be pretty short because, we, you know, obviously the, the, the heart that was put in the, the recipient's body wasn't their own. Um, the observations that go into numerical forecast models uh, are, are uh, incongruent with the equations because the atmosphere is, is very complicated and the equations are, you know, only equations that are, are, are best understanding the atmosphere. So there's a fundamental incompatibility. And so over the last, you know, 20 years, our ability to learn how to uh, adjust the model, just like you, you give, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, drugs to a, a recipient of a heart transplant to where you help their body adjust to the new heart. We actually have technologies that help us adjust the model to the observations. That's what's called data assimilation. That has been dramatically improved over the last 20 or so years to where we're now uh, able to, uh, in fact, forecast the atmosphere as accurate today out to 72 or more hours uh, compared to what we did, say, only 36 hours in advance uh, 20 years ago. So tremendous improvements have been made. And what about CAPS, the Center for Analysis and Prediction of Storms? That's where you are. And tell us uh, about how that center uh, incorporates all of those elements you just described. Right. Uh, so CAPS was one of the first 11 uh, science and technology centers funded back in um, 1989 by the National Science Foundation. Um, the idea of these centers arose through uh, Eric Block, who was then the director of NSF, who said, you know, we really need to have uh, what we call today grand challenge uh, problems and things like that. But basically, these science technology centers were geared toward trying to tackle a problem that maybe didn't even have an answer to it, didn't even have a solution or a known pathway toward an answer. But if it turned out that you could solve the problem, it would have such tremendous societal relevance and so much value that it warranted, say, uh, an investment over a 10-year period of order 20 or $30 million. And the original um, competition had 323 uh, proposals submitted and only 11 got funded. And we were in that uh, group, uh, first group of 11. Uh, and uh, our, our problem was sort of what I've been describing, uh, the idea of of could you use a computer model, a sophisticated computer model, the atmosphere, to try to actually predict thunderstorms in advance of their occurrence? Um, back at that time, 25 years ago, the general thinking was thunderstorms are pretty much chaos and turbulence, and they probably don't have much deterministic predictability. And we don't know exactly when they occur and why they occur and so on. You know, fast forward 25 years, uh, we were able to demonstrate the practical capability of predicting uh, storms 
Uh, we, in fact, today are running uh, forecast models across the entire United States, you know, one model domain across the CONUS, as we call it, the continental U.S. At resolutions, uh, horizontal grid spacings of order a kilometer, where we're capturing individual storms and getting their timing, location, and so on within maybe a county, two or three hours, six hours in advance. And, and so it really, one of the interesting things about that, uh, we had to have the data, and that's where the next Rad Doppler radar network came in, uh, very important. It was commissioned roughly at the time that we started the center. So it, you know, it gave us the data we needed to initialize the model. But this whole notion of predicting storms really kind of uh, overturned, to some extent, the theory that Ed Lorenz, who's kind of the father of chaos theory at MIT, who's since passed away, um, he sort of suggested that the atmosphere on that time scale probably wasn't predictable for longer than, you know, 10 minutes or so. And we've shown for certain kinds of storms, lines, supercell storms that bear tornadoes and things like that, they have much, much longer predictability times than Lorenz's theory suggested. We don't completely still understand the reasons why. Uh, but what's interesting is back in the, the 60s and 50s, we started predicting the atmosphere even before Lorenz's theories came along that s told us how long you might be able to predict the atmosphere. So the point is that you can, you can predict without really understanding how long you can predict for. So CAPS really un undertook the challenge of, uh, of trying to say, you know, can you predict thunderstorms? The answer is absolutely yes. And it really uh, ushered in a whole new science of what we call storm scale prediction and data assimilation. And if we have a chance to talk about it, that, that really – uh, kind of completely changes the notion of, of how you warn the public about events like this. And that sounds like a real landmark development. What other ones from CAPS can you cite uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so that you're most, uh, I guess, proud of? One of the things that, that came out of CAPS was uh, this recognition that, uh, number one, to be able to predict weather on that scale, as I said earlier, you have to have the initial condition. What is the atmosphere doing right now? And you got to put that in the model and that represents the model starting point for predicting the future. Well, that, that initial state, what we call the initial condition, is, is very, very valuable in its own right. And so one of the things that we realized when we did CAPS was that this initial analysis, which has Doppler radar data and satellite data and aircraft data and everything in it, uh, contains a lot of information that is valuable for people, even though it's valid only right now. And, for example, we had a project with American Airlines that was uh, – geared toward um, using this concept to predict weather at hub airports once we found that, hey, gee, this thing seems to work on occasion. And so it was called Project Hubcaps, <laughs> kind of a strange name. It had a nice ring to it, you know. And, uh, and so we, we uh, did this effort at uh, Fort Worth at their headquarters for three years. And uh, it turned out that the analysis, the initial condition analysis, turned out to be every bit as valuable as a forecast. The forecast can be wrong, <laughs> you know, six hours from now, but the, the analysis is, is quite valuable. And so that, that was one thing we learned. And then from that, we actually created a private company uh, to basically uh, commercialize this type of technology to provide it to different types of industries uh, worldwide, whether it's uh, financial services, oil and, and natural gas trading, uh, communication, transportation services, things like that. And we called the company Weather Decision Technologies because it was not a forecasting company. It was a company that, that built the technologies that enabled one to do uh, forecasting with it. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. So most of us have heard of computer models in relationship to the weather and, and, and climate in particular. Uh, that's a big topic of discussion is the validity of climate prediction models. So how are these different animals from the models that you're using to talk about short time scale thunderstorm prediction and analysis versus these, you know, forecasts that go out decades? That's a really great question. Um, to some extent, it's largely a matter of, of scale. You know, ultimately, climate is basically the average of weather uh, in, in time and space. So you take the weather and say, OK, let's do a seasonal average or whatever. And when it comes to models, um, because climate models are run for such long periods of time, we don't have the computer power to do both long-term uh, uh, simulations of, of the climate system, as well as high fidelity, high resolution uh, on a very, very large scale. So think of global, global scale, global climate, uh, long-term runs, hundreds of years um, the computer power just isn't there to run those at the scale of thunderstorms. So uh, climate models still are not able to represent some of the finest scales that we would like to see in terms of precipitation and clouds. So they're, they're much, much better than they used to be. 
but they also, with those long time scales, have a much, much greater complexity to deal with in terms of biogeochemistry, biochemical cycles, a carbon cycle, solar cycles, volcanic eruptions, you know, all those kinds of things that when you're talking about forecasting thunderstorms for six hours, you know, none of that's relevant. Uh, even in Oklahoma, where we have more, more, hurry, more uh, <laughs> earthquakes these days than we did before, you know, landforms aren't fundamentally changing. The earth is still pretty flat here in Oklahoma. So, uh, so you know, that there's, those are some of the, the big differences uh, in those models. Uh, but fundamentally, they rely on the same types of physics and the same types of equations. Uh, it's just that they're uh, different in terms of what they can physically represent. What do you think of the ability of those kinds of long-term models to uh, explain the current climate trends that we're seeing and, and our confidence in how they can predict trends over the next century? Well, you know, the, the climate models are incredibly sophisticated, um, and they, they do a great job. If you look at climate simulations done by, you know, pick your favorite center around the world, uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research here in the country, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, places like that. If you uh, include all of the, the bells and whistles in the model, include all of the uh, known factors, uh, volcanic eruptions and, and things like that, uh, they're able to reproduce the past climate. That is, these models are able to reproduce past climate uh, quite, quite faithfully. And when you take that stuff out, uh, things really go south. Um, that, you know, so that, that sort of gives you uh, some evidence uh, of, of belief that the models are working as, as well as they can based on our understanding of the atmosphere and so on. Uh, one thing I should have mentioned earlier was that um, whereas the kinds of forecasts that we do of the weather, like, for example, thunderstorms or even the, the weather across the United States, those are so-called initial value problems, whereas I mentioned earlier, we, we give the model a set of initial conditions and we run it forward in time. The climate models are much more boundary, what are called boundary value problems, where the initial condition, you, you say, well, okay, what do we start it from? Well, sometimes you run it to a statistically steady state of you know some particular scenario and then you turn it on and it's the boundary conditions the the vegetative cover the changes in the biogeochemical cycles the solar cycles the earthquake or the uh, volcanic eruptions and things like that all influence the, the the evolution of the climate model so it's it's far less dependent upon the initial condition than it is on the, on the boundary conditions um, so climate models do very well now are they perfect no are weather models perfect you know absolutely not so when, when people ask me about the, uh, the projections, you know, we, we say, well, you know, we only know what the models can tell us, but we have observations that show how the climate system has changed. Um, we, we can have some degree of confidence of what the, the human impacts are versus the natural impacts because we can pull those out selectively from our model runs and compare them with what actually happened. And then when we project to the future, we're, we're saying, well, you know, we don't really know what the future will look like. We may make a variety of estimates of things like carbon in the atmosphere and so on. And instead of doing one calculation, we do maybe 100 calculations in a so-called ensemble. And we actually use this in weather forecasting as well because there is inherent uncertainty in the atmosphere. And you never really know uh, whether you have the physics right. You never really know what the initial conditions are. So you say, well, let's take a variety of sort of you know, realizable estimates of what the state might actually be and run a hundred or a thousand forecasts and then see how they cluster together. And that's the best we can really do. And it's actually a very, very powerful technique. It sounds simple the way I'm explaining it, but, um, but it's actually quite sophisticated. Uh, and that gives us much more confidence in, in, you know, in the models. But are they perfect? No. Are we continuing to learn about complexities of the atmosphere and even things like microbiomes and microorganisms in the ground? Uh, and how they influence the carbon cycle, you know, absolutely, every day we're learning more. So um, science never ends, and, and models are never perfect, but I think they're getting better and better all the time. Thank you. Thanks, Kelvin. So let's switch back to the short-term scale of forecasting storms, violent storms. Um, what's, the, what's your sense of the annual savings we get from the improvements in storm predictions compared to the investment that's necessary to create that capability? Are we on the positive side of the balance sheet? I would say we really are, especially when you put it in the context of lives. And of course, you can't uh, obviously ever put a, a dollar estimate on lives. But uh, the amount of money that we spend on on research is is a pittance, I think, compared to the the massive economic loss that we have from uh, from devastating storms, whether it's winter storms, whether it's landfalling hurricanes, or whatever. Now, obviously, the built infrastructure, um, you know, some of that you just can't you can't prevent from happening. Uh, you can do better with building codes and in terms of uh, you know where people um, you know build uh, in the along the coastal zones. You know, fifty percent of the population in this country lives within fifty miles of a coastline, so it's it's kind of incredible. Um, so we can we can do a lot in terms of policy, but. But as far as the return on investment for the taxpayer, it's, it's just, you know, you'd expect me to say this, but the numbers bear this out, that it's, it's really true. Um, what's important about this isn't just the massive 
events that make the headlines. It's the cumulative day-to-day um, losses that happen due to disruption. You know, the, the airline flights that get canceled just due to storms. There's no accidents. There's no major, you know, problems. It's just this this sort of uh, annoying disruption in the system. Uh, construction projects that get delayed. Uh, you know, things like that. Energy plants. Uh, energy production that gets sort of shut down or, or uh, operates at a, a lower efficiency because the temperature is too high and we're not able to forecast the temperature maybe as accurate as we need to. It's a cumulative effect of those things day to day that really have the biggest impact. But I don't want to dismiss the Hurricane Sandys of the world and, and you know things like that. Those are obviously extremely important as well. Um, but I think that it's you know the technology and the science ha- have really advanced dramatically and, and the quality of the forecasts are, are more important uh, and, and more accurate than ever. But but the key thing ultimately is we're dealing with people here. We're dealing with people who have to make decisions, whether it's somebody in a house where there's a tornado warning issued for them and they have to decide what am I going to do versus an entire community or an entire region of the country like it happened with Hurricane Sandy that, and even this winter with these major storms that, that clearly is, uh, is under a threat. And what do you do? How do you react? What, what's the response? So one of the things that we've done is realize that it's not just a physical science, engineering, and technology problem. It's also a human behavioral and social uh, infrastructure and social science problem. So the real pathway toward the solution of preventing deaths and also limiting uh, damage to property is to bring in those dimensions of of scholarly study in with these other ones that I mentioned and really look at the problem as a whole. And that's what we've been doing now for the last, uh, last several years. I think it's beginning to bear some fruit. Calvin, just really quick, what have you learned about human behavior and with respect to studying weather events? Uh, it's complicated. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, I would say that, you know, some people would say, my goodness, you know, how could you ever predict human behavior? There are models of, of uh, prediction of behavior all over the place. But just as simple examples, you know, when somebody receives a, a, a warning about a particular event uh, that, that threatens their safety, the very first thing they tend to do is seek confirmation. So they'll call a neighbor, they'll walk outside, they'll call a friend, they'll turn on the TV. And, uh, and that's not a bad thing to do necessarily. It's just that they, they lose time in doing that. So really understanding how people interpret information. You know, a lot of the information that's communicated to individuals in terms of weather threats was designed by meteorologists. We're not social behavioral scientists. And it turns out that we've done some studies here at the university that show even the folks that live in the southeastern part of the United States uh, maybe like up to 50% in certain cases, don't know how to interpret the uh, the cone of uncertainty of a hurricane that's approaching the coast. You know, you've seen the maps where you see the cone of uncertainty and the, the circles as the hurricane gets closer. And a lot of folks think that it means the hurricane's getting bigger in size. Well, you say, no, of course, that's not the case. But a lot of, you know, why would they not think that? It's not obvious that it's not the case. So there's a lot of work going on there to really understand the, the basics. But what's really interesting is technology really is now allowing us the capability of providing information customized in a lot of ways to people's, say, educational uh, attainment levels, to their socioeconomic status, things like that. Because one size fits all is just not, doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. Some people have a different ability to interpret information uh, differently than others. So we're really looking at that very hard because at the end of the day, we're all about preventing people from dying and losing their livelihood and, and you know through through loss of property and so on. So these things are really as we think about the problem in its totality help inform a broader solution pathway than just a, a pure uh, hey the fork if all we need is better forecast you know, that just isn't isn't enough. So we've got a lot more people in the US than say back in the 1950s when storm science and the study of thunderstorms and tornadoes really got going. Uh, yet today, you know, it's 60 years later, we still have about the same annual number of fatalities, you know, in the 500 range. So I guess that's a success in that we have a higher population and yet a steady uh, number of casualties, but still, it's still 500 people a year. Uh, a year. So how do we drive that number down? Well, I, I think you're right. You know, absolutely. In 1956, I think 519 people died in tornadoes in this country when, when the technology was, you know, wired telephones and black and white TVs that had only been around for 10 years. We had no national prediction structure, no national radar network. We had transistor radios and so on and so forth. Uh, in, um, in 2011, 550 people died. And as you say, that number in 2011 uh, with population density and so on could have easily been three or 4,000 people. So we have to celebrate the fact that it's not as bad as it could have been. But 550 human beings in this country dying uh, due to weather to me is just just intolerable. I, I just can't tell you how that bothers me and, and my colleagues. So ultimately, I think that the issue is better science, better technology, better understanding, better prediction, but also understanding how people 
receive information, interpret information, and act on that information. And I don't mean to be saying it's all about social and human behavioral science. It's not. But those pieces, I think I'm absolutely convinced, are, are very, very important. And I think once we really crack the code on that and, and do this problem in an integrative way, um, I think we'll see uh, the, the death toll go down, uh, hopefully dramatically. There are going to be those individuals who will you know, decide to, to, hey, look, I'm not leaving. I'm staying here. You can't make me leave. You know, that's always going to happen. But I think that um, I think that the you know the larger um, uh, death tolls that we're seeing, if we can get those dramatically reduced, I think we can count that as a win. But my my goal, my mantra, and I testified in Congress uh, saying this: zero deaths. Um, it sounds unbelievable. It sounds ridiculous. But on the other hand, uh, in in uh, if you look at wind shear uh, accidents in, in commercial aviation. Uh, you know, we were seeing a lot of deaths from those in the 70s, and, and uh, through the good work of uh, meteorologists, began to understand what, what was going on there. And through training and through better technology and awareness and systems on board the airplanes, I don't think there's been a, a crash in over 30 years. I think the last one was 1985. So is, is zero deaths a, an outrageous goal? Maybe, but aren't we outrageous in our goals anyway? We want to be positively outrageous, ridiculously positive, uh, you know, incredibly generous in our time to say, look, let's go for zero deaths. We can make it happen. And if anybody on the planet can do it, I believe the United States can. So tell us about a recent weather event where our advanced forecasting system actually saved lives and in, in, in an incredible way. I think that snowstorm in the Northeast um, that hit D.C. And, um, and New York, uh, I think that was very, very well forecast. Um, I do think there were some, what, 47 deaths or something like that, massive disruption in air travel and so on. But, you know, compared to what it could have been, I think uh, that was an incredibly good forecast. And of course, you're, you're hopeful that uh, the people convey the forecast in an accurate way that, that they don't hype it up and things like that. And that's where, of course, the the TV weathercasters and the media are, are extremely important. That's why the partnerships that we have in the weather community with those individuals is so important because they're very much on the front lines. So um, I think that snowstorm was was one where uh, people saw it coming from a long ways away. Uh, you know, that's some of the deaths were due to heart attacks, people shoveling snow afterwards, and so on. But um, but yeah, I think that was extremely well done. But there have been a lot of really, really, I think, excellent forecasts that have, um, have played out well. And that, of course, that snowstorm was over a huge part of the Northeast, and it, it encompassed you know areas where there were power outages and things. But the advanced planning minimized the downtime, and that that I think is so important. Plus, you know, the government shut down. Congress was shut down for like a whole week, right? I mean, I think they said we're not doing uh, anything on the Hill, and I think government agencies basically closed for almost a week, if I remember right. Wasn't there a big storm uh, two, three years ago in your backyard and more uh, where the prediction of a, a severe storm pattern really um, protected a lot of people in that, uh, in that uh, system? Yeah, it really did. Uh, we've had like uh, uh, three or four hundred year storms in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Oh, boy. Here, it seems like. <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. May 20th. Uh, and then actually 11 days later, uh, and that was a very devastating storm. The, the path paralleled uh, the last couple of uh, very severe uh, storms in Moore, Oklahoma, the tornadic storms. Uh, Eleven days later, on May 31st, it was um, it was um, Memorial Day weekend. There was another series of storms that moved in from the west, and um, there was some some perhaps uh, uh, unwise uh, guidance given uh, to individuals uh, from from media about you know this is a very devastating uh, situation. You know, uh, you really need to if you're if you're not underground, you know it's it's a bad situation. So uh, in that case, thousands upon thousands of people fled south basically turned the interstates and all the other uh, roadways, the side roads, into parking lots. And that really is a, is a human behavioral challenge. People were responding uh, in the way that they saw fit uh, by fleeing their homes. And, of course, the last place you want to be in a tornado, literally if the tornado is close by you, is in a car. I mean, it, it becomes a missile. And so, uh, fortunately, the storms did not turn south. Had they done that, it could have been an absolute disaster. So I think it's a lesson learned, uh, and it's a, it's a great example, and I showed it uh, in testimony on the Hill, and a lot of people have used this example of how, how important studying human behavior is. Now, studying it doesn't mean you can control it, of course, but, but what you can control is the messaging, and you can be better informed about people, how people are going to be responding to the messaging. So Calvin, sometimes we make a storm forecast, and it influences people's behavior in almost the opposite sense of what we'd like them to do. Rather than sheltering in place, they think they've got to take action. Describe that sort of psychological response to a storm warning. 
That's exactly right. And we've actually done a study here recently where we uh, looked at people's response uh, hypothetically to a, a storm warning using different uh, increasing levels of, of hyperbole in the language. So going from, say, this is a severe situation to a, a dangerous situation to maybe a, a devastating situation to an inconceivable situation, for example. And those probably weren't exactly the words that were used, but something along those lines. And so you, you normally would think, okay, the more intensive that language becomes and the more uh it really is like oh gosh this is getting really bad that they would they would just even the people would have a more of a sense to hunker down and stay where they're at it had just the opposite effect once you you hit a particular level of intensity of the language when you went beyond that and started even you know using more more uh you know hyperbolic language they said okay i've got to get out of here if I stay here, I'm clearly going to die. And, and so they would end up fleeing when, in, in fact, what you want to do was to, to you know, really anchor them in place with, with the intensity of the language you were using. That was a bit of an unexpected uh, response. And so when you, when you craft the language and you think about, okay, how do different people respond to this? Um, maybe they'll respond, uh, you know, sort of find the sweet spot of the intensity, but then say, okay, will everybody get that? Will, will people who maybe have a high school education be the same as people who have have gone to graduate school. Uh, how about people who maybe you know have a grade school education, or children who are uh, ten or twelve years old who are maybe by themselves? Are they going to even know what to do with that? So we have to become much more sophisticated in understanding the the language we use, and then thinking about it's not a one size fits all audience. And given the ubiquity of, of smartphones and stuff, you know, kids that are in school, especially because of obviously the situations they face in school, they have these devices, and you can communicate with them. So. There's a richness of study there that is really untapped, I think, that, that ultimately I think will, will go a long way toward uh, uh, you know, saving lives and helping people do not what, you know, they're not robots. We're not trying to control them. We're trying to inform them. Ultimately, they need to make the decision they feel is right for them. But we also have to give them as much information as possible that they can digest as quickly as possible and know what their options are and to make the call that is, is best for their situation. One of the things I found really interesting with, you know, some of the recent weather, major weather events, whether winter storms or tornadoes or hurricanes is, you know, there are more uh, forecasters who are using Facebook and using Twitter and using a lot of social, different social media platforms, essentially, to get the information out to people, not just these are the things that are going to potentially occur, but this is why, and this is information and kind of an explanation behind some of these weather events. Um, how do you think social media is changing with respect to how people learn or can even prepare for weather events? Oh, that's a great question. I'm so glad you brought that up. You're, you're spot on. It truly is changing. Uh, in fact, even folks that are uh, on the on the on TV live, especially down here, but this is true other places. Um, they have individuals that are, are putting social media posts uh, up up for them uh, on their behalf. They're, they are providing additional explanation and so on because people aren't always in front of a TV or, or listening to a radio. And social media is, is obviously a great way to reach individuals. Um, and they do, as you say, they provide a lot of additional explanation, you know, more caveats and things like that. The interesting challenge there, I think, is. Um, people are bombarded with a variety of sources of information. And of course, one of the key things that, to think about uh, that is certainly the case now, the, the National Weather Service is really the authoritative single source and its, its mission um, is to ensure protection of life and property. That's a fundamentally a government uh, function for the good of, uh, of the nation. And, and so, you know, everybody gets kind of the same information from the National Weather Service, but then TV stations have their own radars and own facilities and things like that. So they add their own interpretation, which is, is absolutely right. But then the question is, how do people then navigate this this tremendous uh, you know blast of, of stuff coming from uh, all different directions? Uh, and in fact, they do this a lot of times here in Oklahoma. They'll say, "Well, I, I'm I'm watching these four different uh, individuals, and you know, uh, and they're saying similar but also dissimilar things." And and you know, where how do you develop the trust factor? Well, trust is extremely important. That's why most people seek a confirmation of of information if it's you know some threat to their safety because they don't necessarily believe it despite you know where it's coming from they they want to seek a trusted source the other challenge of course is um the possibility of especially in a time like a severe weather event that is is quite uh, dangerous and, and things are moving very quickly of somebody getting in there and putting out misinformation and uh, and that's you know and that could really cause tremendous upheaval if you're going in hacking an account and you're truly posting something that appears as though it's coming from somebody that everybody, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people trust. And all of a sudden it's, it's the wrong thing. And somebody is messing around with you. 
that scares the life out of me. It really does. And that, that's another aspect of, of this whole communication thing. And technology is wonderful, but it, it has its limitations. Well, I've personally not seen that happen, but I, I think it's quite possible, especially look at the snowstorm in the Northeast. You could have caused massive disruption of all kinds of civil infrastructure just with a few messages that are sent out. Um, you know, it could just been unbelievable. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Where are the computing facilities that feed you know, national predictions of severe weather? And where are they located and how many radars are around the country that feed into this computer cluster? And do you have any idea how much that whole infrastructure costs annually? The National Weather Service budget annually is close to a billion dollars, I think. Uh, the computing facilities are uh, in, in, uh, in Maryland, uh, I believe. They've got a backup facility now. I believe it's in Florida. Um, things have changed uh, recently, and, and so they do have a full hot spare backup that if there's you know, a major outage in one place, they can completely stand something up basically seamlessly. Uh, so we're, we're quite resilient, I think, in that regard. Um, in terms of, of the, uh, the weather prediction infrastructure. And of course, there's all manner of communications uh, uh, technologies uh, globally that bring in observations from across the planet continuously from satellites to weather balloons to aircraft and surface observations and so on. Um, the actual radar network in this country, it's about 168 uh, Doppler radars, Doppler weather radars, the so-called NEXRAD network, and it's been around for about 20 years now. It's, it's uh, uh, undergone a major upgrade recently to what's called dual polarization capability, which essentially means that it can now detect and discriminate among different types of precipitation. Is it a hailstone? Is it a, is it a, a water-covered snowflake? Is it snow? Is it ice crystals? Is it rain? Big drops, small drops, things like that. Very, very important for aviation and all kinds of other, in terms of even forecasting uh, groundwater and, and, and surface flooding and hydrologic uh, feeding of hydrologic models and things like that. So the infrastructure is quite extensive, and, and, uh, and that is supplemented by a number of other networks that are out there, uh, private networks, uh, surface networks that are run by energy companies and things like that. One of the things I think is, is, is quite nice is that uh, you know, weather data are pretty much uh, have always been viewed as free and openly available. So all of the data that are gathered by the National Weather Service uh, are made available to private companies who add value by customizing products and adding things to uh, you know, bringing different different data streams together and so on and so forth. So it's a very, very resilient system, I would say. Um, there was actually recently a uh, a hacking into the system, into the government system. Um, don't know exactly where it came from. They assumed that it was uh, the Chinese government. But it hacked into uh, a satellite data feed, and it caused about a two- or three-day um, diminution in the quality of our uh, global weather forecasts. And it, I say two or three days, it happened, I believe, you know, sort of like one model run, but it took a while for that to recover because that model run is the, the basis for the next model run, you know, so it's mm. kind of a, so it took a while to recover from that. So uh, information security, cybersecurity, extremely important in this, uh, in this system uh, in terms of the data that come in. And then also, as you say, the, you know, the information that goes out and is uh, given to the public. Um, just kind of going back, if I could just quickly on this issue, issue of uh, social media, uh, the, the social scientists here at OU actually uh, um, gather data from all the Twitter feeds and all of the uh, uh, Facebook posts and stuff uh, globally. And so they do all kinds of studies looking for keywords, like especially during outbreaks of things, you know, words like tornado and severe weather and threat and, and stuff like that. And they actually can monitor all of this in real time to see how humans are reacting to this. Uh, what's the information flow? Are people adding words to say what the National Weather Service is providing and, and it, you know, kind of with all good intention, maybe miscommunicating the level of the threat and so on. So that type of research is actually going on here and many other places as well. But, but we have a really great group that studies that sort of thing here. Let's scale up from the short time scale local tornado events and go up to the big regional hurricane impacts that we see every year. Uh, you've been instrumental in proposing uh, a national hurricane research initiative to take on the rising costs that we're seeing from hurricane-related damage and casualties. Tell us about that and uh, what kind of um, reduction in the damage that we see can uh, result. Right. No, that's a, that's a great question. And my, my partner there was Ken Ford, <laughs> who you know very well. He's a yes. terrific visionary guy, uh, just, a, just a tremendous um, 
tremendous individual. And uh, um, we kind of kind of hatched this idea together that when you look at uh, you look at the the capabilities that we have, and you look at the 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 damage that is done and the, and the lack of resilience. So gee, surely there's more that we can do. And, and if you look at the national earthquake, uh, national earthquake program, there was uh, one of those that started back, I believe in the the seventies. Uh, and, uh, it was a national earthquake, uh, engineering program, I believe it was called or something along those lines, uh, that, uh, was sort of a risk reduction, hazard reduction type program, uh, mobilized across the federal government to really tackle the issue of, of earthquakes. And um, we said, gee, you know, we need something like that for hurricanes because we have, um, you know, again, so much uh, of the wealth of this country is along uh, vulnerable coastal zones and, uh, and it just continues to, to grow and grow and grow. And so part of it is a, an issue of understanding the atmosphere. Part of it's an issue of understanding the built infrastructure and the resilience of buildings to, uh, to wind stresses and, and water, uh, storm surge and things like that. Part of it also is a an information technology problem where when you do have disasters and you lose networks, you lose power and things like that, can you very, very quickly bring in, uh, you know, temporary capabilities, uh, for example, by flying unmanned aerial vehicles around to create, uh, you know, self-configuring wireless uh, networks with cell phone, uh, ta- you know, instead of cell phone towers, you actually have them flying around the the in the air uh, to restore those kinds of very, very critical infrastructures that are needed in the first, you know, uh, two, three, four days after disaster to find victims to bring, uh, you know, first aid in and, and, and deal with things like gas leaks and, and you know, uh, live power lines and things like that. So we, we looked at that. And one of the things that, that Ken and I realized is you looked at the totality of the problem and, and how to really prioritize. Uh, we said, you know, ultimately, this, again, is a problem that isn't just we need better forecasts. It, it, it has these multiple facets. And we were proposing a, an initiative that really looked at uh, at researching the hurricane in a way that really hadn't been done before in the totality of the social, physical infrastructure, behavioral science domains. And we were suggesting the creation of a, um, basically a, a, a kind of a virtual laboratory where folks that modeled human behavior, that modeled hurricanes, that modeled how buildings react to these kinds of, uh, of wind and wave stresses and stuff could, could kind of both physically and virtually collaborate with one another and learn each other's language and learn how each other thinks and learn how to tackle the problem from a holistic point of view. And so we, we uh, actually uh, wrote a report, uh, the National Science Board wrote a report and, and put it out there. And we did have some congressional support for a couple of years. As I recall, uh, Senator Nelson and Senator Landrieu and, and others were, uh, I believe, Vitter perhaps, were, were quite supportive of this thing. Uh, it never did get uh, any money appropriated to it. But, but fundamentally, the idea is still valid. You know, it's, it's not that, I mean, the report, I think, was 2007. And here we are, you know, almost 10 years later. The ideas haven't gone away. If you go read that report, you'd say we could have written it yesterday. Um, and so I think it's the kind of challenge that we as a nation need to address. And, you know, we were, I believe the budget we were calling for was $300 million. And you look at disasters, um, you know, hurricanes and, and, and the inland devastation, then also the the kind of the, the ringing of the bell uh, impact, as I call it, you know, the, the, the hurricane Hurricane hitting hitting uh, the land is is the ring, is the bell you're ringing the bell, but then you have all this reverberation afterward when you're rebuilding and you have all of the the ripple effect through the economy of of, of needing the wood products, of needing the appliances, of needing the labor force, the, the infrastructure. It, it lasts for years and years, uh, and so you know we tried to say, look, we have to study this um, and not be so reactive. We need to be much more proactive as a nation. Yeah, it's an investment in preventing that huge economic loss that comes after a storm. Why not head that off at the pass with this research uh, program? Sounds like a great investment. Right, and it's sort of difficult in, in many respects, if you think about this, to capture what the economic loss is. Um, because, the, the, you know, the immediate loss and the displacement of families and, of course, the loss of life. But you look at the economic impacts of closed businesses and, and businesses that never reopen and stuff. How do you how do you track all that? And so there are you know studies that are done uh, and the very authoritative studies. But it's difficult. Even now, I would bet you even today, Katrina and Rita and some of the, the major uh, storms that have hit the Gulf Coast in the last 10 years, probably still have impacts that are going on even now, even in the insurance industry, you know, premiums, people that aren't able to get insurance now, higher rates, you know, that, that, that is something that is, is really incredible. And again, you know, one of the things that Ken and I realized also in, in, in that report was, um, and, and this, is, this is fairly well known, a lot of the building codes that are already in existence just aren't enforced. And so you go in there and you realize, oh gosh, you know, if they could just, you know, enforce the codes that are already on the books, a lot of the uh, the property loss could be prevented. That I wouldn't 
hazard to, to give a guess of what that percentage would be, but, but you talk to a lot of people and then they will tell you that. Well, with the state of the art today, what do you think that are the easiest weather events to predict and work your way on up to the ones that are toughest for us to get a handle on prediction? That's a really great question, and it truly gets to this issue of, of the fundamental predictability of, of the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, Lorenz's theory basically said that you know the larger scale events, uh, like the big highs and lows that move across the weather map, the, the big fronts and things like that, uh, have the greater predictability because the physics that drive them are uh, somewhat simpler and, and they're uh, in some cases quasi two dimensional, so they're not so three dimensional. Uh, we understand that pretty well. Uh, uh, we needed you know more powerful computers and so on, but so so forecasting those events is 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 you know we do a pretty good job of that and we continue to improve. Um, at the other extreme, when you're down at the scale of, of say, for example, individual clouds, and you think about um, uh, laser-guided munitions in the theater of operations uh, of some type of uh, military uh, deployment, and you say, well, gee, you know, clouds are a problem because lasers can't see through clouds. So how do you deal with that? So you know, forecasting individual clouds and cloud cover is extremely difficult because the you know it depends on knowing where the moisture is, and moisture is incredibly highly variable. And we don't observe it on nearly the, the fine scales that we need to. So in that case, say predicting an individual cloud is, is exceptionally difficult and probably has very, very little predictive skill. Kind of moving up scale, thunderstorms, lines of storms, you know, much more predictable. Not necessarily the individual storm itself, the individual, you know, storm, uh, thunderstorm cloud, but maybe the aggregate of the storm, the, the squall line, where the leading edge of the line is, where the, the region of lighter precipitation behind the line is. Um, we now know that that rotating thunderstorms that that have updrafts that rotate tend to be more predictable because they're they're more resilient to uh, turbulent decay, and we understand the reasons why uh, that's the case. The more garden variety of storms that happen in the summertime, pretty darn tough to predict. We can kind of predict where the areas might be, but actually predicting an in individual storm that might only last thirty or forty minutes it's such a short time scale that um, the predictability limit is is pretty pretty uh, pretty short, pretty small. Um, and, and then, of course, on the climate scale, you know, when we talk about predicting, we, we typically mean sensitivity to initial conditions. So if, you know, predicting a thunderstorm means how accurate do you have the initial condition and do you understand the physics? The climate system prediction is a sort of a different animal, as I said, because it depends on really having the boundary conditions uh, as accurate as you can and all the physical processes that happen with biogeochemical cycles and, and stuff like that. Um, and, and again, we, we run ensemble models and we, we test our models against past climate to see how well they, uh, they behave. But, but I would say overall, we're not yet close to, to hitting the theoretical limit of weather prediction, the sort of what we're used to watching on the evening uh, newscast, which fundamentally has a limit of about two weeks. Our forecast accuracy about, you know, after about three days, four days is, is you know, not, not great. Uh, a week ahead of time, uh, you know, not, not, not very good at all. Um, 10 days, forget it. Um, so beyond about 10 days, we're not very good. So, you know, we're, we're really through all the things we've talked about improving our predictive skill, frankly, on all scales. And, uh, you know, I foresee the day at some point where, you know, we are running a global model that is predicting individual thunderstorms, uh, all the way up to, you know, the global weather and doing so for very long periods of time. You know, we're talking maybe 30, 40 years in the future, but those days are coming. The technology will get us there. And I think the science will continue to advance to where the predictive skill just continues to go up. But fundamentally, there is a, is a fundamental theoretical limit of about two weeks uh, to, uh, to weather prediction that we'll never be able to surpass. So what's being done to better predict some of these events all the way from small scale to, lo to large scale to global? Um, what are, what's the current science and where are things heading for meteorology? Well, I think, you know, the, the one thing to realize is that every part of the atmosphere talks to every other part of the atmosphere. So a little thunderstorm that happens over Oklahoma can have an influence on, on the weather a week from now in a completely other part of the world. So that, that sort of connectivity, what we call nonlinearity or, or chaos, uh, really makes the atmosphere difficult because everything talks to everything else. And we have massive scales, right? An individual cloud might be the order of a, a kilometer or two uh, in diameter. Uh, and, and, of course, then you have these, these large-scale weather systems that are the size of, you know, three or 4,000 miles across. They're all connected in, in one way or another. And so understanding that connectivity and then also capturing it in a model is very, very difficult. Um, really, the advances in prediction will come with, with continuing to move forward in areas that we've already uh, talked about. Number one is um, better observing the atmosphere. And I think one of the most important things that we can do, and, and uh, reports have been written on this <clears throat> by the National Academy of Sciences, is from the area from the ground up to about 
oh, two, three miles high in the atmosphere. Now, that's where uh, a lot of the energy of the atmosphere is. It's where we live, of course, at the ground. But uh, a lot of stuff happens and is driven by that part of the atmosphere, but yet it's one of the most poorly observed parts of the atmosphere. We do a great job of observing at the ground. We observe the volume of the atmosphere with radars. That's remote sensing. What we don't have are sensors that actually uh, you know, sit in the atmosphere in the lowest uh, two, three miles. One of the things that shows the greatest promise there are drones, unmanned aerial vehicles. These little quadcopters you see at the mall. Imagine uh, every surface observing site uh, across the United States, of which there are thousands of them, uh, launching one of these things automatically every hour to go up to three or four miles high, two, three miles high, and uh, every hour giving you a profile of the lower part of the atmosphere. I think that would really revolutionize both our understanding of the atmosphere and our ability to predict it. Um, so observations, very, very important, improving satellite observations, things like that. Of course, continuing to improve our physics, the models, more powerful computers, and of course, data assimilation. And then ultimately, I'd say doing better with what we already have in terms of communicating information, taking what we already have and doing a better job with it. There's always room for improvement there. So those are the five areas that I would say would probably be, uh, you know, the, the keys to the future. And are there other fields of study that would be relevant to studying weather? So, you know, I know in biomedical research, uh, ideas, kind of groundbreaking ideas uh, have come out of looking at, you know, financial patterns off of Wall Street or something along those lines. Are there other areas that might be relevant to um, some of the research that you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. It's a very good question. Um, you know, the the thing that I've been calling data assimilation, uh, it takes a variety of different forms that are done in engineering and optimal control theory and design of efficient uh, traffic infrastructures and moving cars efficiently and so on. Uh, all of that kind of, in some sense, boils down to optimization of what's called inverse theory and inverse problems. So um, basic mathematics, uh, some of the, the, the work in basic physics uh, of understanding how molecules uh, work uh, can really help us uh, you develop new computation. Techni uh, techniques to solve the equations that we solve in our numerical models. Um, and that is a very important thing uh, in computational fluid dynamics. People study uh, flames and study fire and how, say, combustion, internal combustion jet airplane engines study the flow of, of fluids and things like that are very, very relevant to the atmosphere because the atmosphere is nothing more than a fluid. And it's a multi-phase fluid. It has you know, the dry atmosphere, there's, there's water vapor, and then there's condensed material cloud, and then there's also precipitation of various forms. So very, very complicated. So multi-phase flow that people study in, in all kinds of industrial applications has tremendous applications to the, uh, to the atmosphere. And then, of course, human behavior, which is psychology, sociology, anthropology, political science, uh, social behavioral sciences, and economics are very important as well. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I listen to STEM Talk, interviewing the most interesting people in the world of science and technology. Stay curious, my friends. Um, so I'm just going to jump back and ask you a personal question. So you had talked about growing up in Kansas, and you talked about uh, doing the photography as an undergrad and, and shooting uh, images of storms so that you could get uh, information for debris from storms and get estimates of wind speeds. And I'm sure you've spent a lot of other time in the field uh, with your research with respect to tornadoes and, and in other storm situations. What's the most severe weather event that you've ever personally experienced? I've been very close to tornadoes, um, the Moore tornado and some other tornadoes. Um, I've not been in a hurricane yet. Ken promised me that he would take me hurricane chasing. He hasn't made good on that yet, so I gotta gotta hold him to that. I just want to be along the beach where there's not going to be a piece of sheet metal come to decapitate me or something like that. You know, where I can experience the wind and stuff. Um, but I, you know, I guess I guess I would just have to say you know, it would be it would be very severe storms where the winds are topping out 120 miles an hour. Uh, and of course, out in the field where I chase storms, uh, and, and we've intentionally done what we call uh, punching the core through the core of the storm, where you get massive hail. We've been in a situation where the the car was totaled, the, you know, the windshield was completely you know, busted out, and everything like that. Um, but I've not I've not been I've not actually been close enough to a tornado to to have been impacted by the debris field or anything like that. Thank goodness. Uh, but I would say something. You know, I would say just you know close enough to a tornadic storm to have gone through the core and. Uh, you know, and, and the guest front and things like that. Mm -hmm. Not not super exciting. <laughs> it's exciting enough. <laughs> so, Kelvin, uh, you know, I've read 
some really fascinating books on storms, you know, The Perfect Storm and Isaac Storm about the, the 1900 Galveston hurricane. Do you read books about storms and the weather? And if so, tell us what you've been reading lately. Um, uh, not really, to be honest. In fact, I've never seen the movie Twister, <laughs> to be honest. Really? <laughs> you might say, why in the world? I say, well, yeah, I, um, you know, honestly, I don't, I don't read that kind of, I'm, I'm sort of a fan of history overall, sort of a political history as well in particular. Um, but I don't, don't tend to read too much about the weather. I, I live it so much as my day job though. In the last several years, I've, I'm no longer a uh, director of CAP. So I'm, I'm um, much more on the research administration side here, which I love because then I get to work across basically all disciplines as a vice president for research. And that is so much fun. Um, and in fact, to, to engage humanists and to engage people in, in uh, social and behavioral sciences and get them juiced about the kinds of things we're doing. And, and, you know, a lot of times, a, a, you know, a professor in classics or something will say, you know, how, how do I, what do I have to do with this? You know, I, I study, uh, you know, ancient Greek culture and we actually have a, a, a faculty member here who's our provost. He's a really renowned uh, researcher, uh, who's studying, uh, basically climate change in the Greek, uh, Greek culture and, you know, the ancient Greek culture and also how that affected human health back then. And so there are all kinds of ways to connect folks to, uh, to weather, to extreme events, to climate change, to, to, to environmental problems and challenges. Uh, I have another colleague in anthropology who's uh, looking at dental calculus, uh, to do DNA testing uh, of ancient peoples. And it's kind of like a tree ring. You can sort of peel it back layer by layer and get a historical perspective of how the environment changed over their lifetime and then look at health disparities. And so again, linkages between health, the environment, ancient DNA, just so many cool uh, linkages like that. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time reading books on that sort of thing because I work with a lot of folks and I just more read journal articles <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, and, and a lot of policy stuff because I'm still on the National Science Board. So try to stay up with policy. I've looked down from space and seen violent thunderstorms and mesoscale systems across the continents and very exciting to see lightning flashing at night. And lately we've heard uh, discoveries made from satellites and high-flying aircraft about uh, blue spikes and red shrikes. I can't really even remember the terminology, but it looks like we're getting some insights into how storms work even from space these days. Can you comment on that? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, in fact, um, those sprites and, and, and elves, and they go by all, all these kind of funky names. Yeah, um, absolutely true. Uh, the, the space program has been extraordinarily valuable, even from the early days uh, when we were doing U-2 overflights of thunderstorms back in the, in the 60s. Uh, and then, then, of course, getting the satellites and then the, the shuttle has been just in, immensely valuable. A lot of what we sort of thought we knew about uh, storm electrification and atmospheric electrification has been kind of turned on its ear. Uh, we know that thunderstorms produce x-rays, in fact, uh, in, in lightning fields. And, and that was that was kind of a kind of an aha moment. And, and, and frankly, the role of precipitation in, in creating charge distributions and, and the electric field, how the electric field is set up in storms, is, uh, is, is, is governing ways that are quite different compared to what we thought. And then how you relate that now with the, the, the dual polarization Doppler radar data, where you can actually understand and sense and, and surveil what types of precipitation there and relate that back to the, uh, to the charge distribution, which you have to get th really through balloons and then VHF networks and things like that, uh, all the way towards saying, you know, what relationship is there between lightning and, uh, and tornadoes? And uh, one of the interesting things is where you really have no radar network like over the oceans, uh, uh, lightning can be a tremendous proxy for, uh, for you know, convection and, and assimilating uh, stuff on, on thunderstorms, data on thunderstorms into numerical forecast models where you have really very few observations. So, uh, so that, yeah, absolutely. The spaceborne platforms, including active radar, have been very, very, uh, very uh, powerful in terms of transforming our understanding. Uh, a lot of folks are still very interested in lighting. We have a big program here in New Mexico uh, has programs, and uh, we still have students that are willing to go out and chase storms to gather data and lighting. I would never do that myself, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it's still a tremendous area of inquiry. Contrary to popular belief, we don't put them in our proposals as expendable equipment. We, we don't. <laughs> so, uh, Calvin, I just want to say thanks again for being on the show. Thank you very much. It was a privilege, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. STEM talk. STEM, talk. STEM, talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. Certainly that was an interesting interview on a topic that impacts all of our lives. We make jokes about weather prediction, but it is frankly quite good these days, and much of the improvement is driven by very sophisticated weather models of the kind that Dr. Drogemeyer and his colleagues have developed over the years. 
Absolutely. Kelvin shared a wealth of solid information and his passion for the topic was obvious in his voice. I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where one can find the show notes for this show and for every episode of STEM Talk, stemtalk.us. This is Don Cornega signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until next time. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.